Good morning. <laughs> the yin yang symbol. For me, this represents my emotional side and my analytical side. Most of my life, these have been in good balance. But this was my yin yang symbol on November 3rd, 2014, when I learned I had ovarian cancer. My emotional side took over completely. It was about a year before I could even talk about my cancer diagnosis without bursting into tears. <laughs> but gradually, my analytical side returned. And when it did, I started making observations. These observations have led to an idea, and it is this idea that I bring to you today. The idea is not based on statistical, statistically significant data. It is the first part of the scientific process. It is based on observations. It is an idea I am extremely passionate about, <laughs> and I believe it is an idea worth spreading. A little about what makes me tick. My mom was a woman ahead of her time. She still is a woman ahead of her time. She graduated from Florida State University in the 40s when most women did not go to college. There was no football team. It was an all women's college at the time. My dad's career was in the field of radiological physics. He did cancer research. Uh, for radiation oncology, he worked at Johns Hopkins, Columbia University, and Albert Einstein Medical College. Our dog got cancer, breast cancer, in the 70s and benefited from this connection and was able to participate in one of the experimental treatments. <laughs> I liked observation and observing things and detective work from a young age. I can still hear my mother's voice reading Sherlock Holmes stories out loud in the car on long car rides. And in high school, I belonged to a treasure hunt club. <laughs> my professional background is in GIS, Geographic Information Systems, spatial analysis, database, code, program, debugging software, its own form of detective work. Between the ages of 15 and 33, four people very close to me passed away from cancer. My uncle Eddie died of lung cancer. My cousin Cookie passed away from breast cancer. My cousin Liz passed away from pancreatic cancer. <coughs> And in 1990, 24 years before my diagnosis, my roommate in Boston passed away from ovarian cancer. All of these deaths had a huge impact on me. And I was determined to do what I could to prevent myself from having to experience the ravages of a cancer diagnosis. So my analytical side stepped back made some observations, I saw some risk factors. So I made conscious lifestyle decisions. I ate well, I ate close to the ground, I exercised regularly, I never smoked, and I've been doing yoga and tai chi way before they were featured in commercials. <laughs> Teal. Teal is the color for ovarian cancer. My story of my diagnosis begins in the spring of 2014. I experienced three vague symptoms. I had a bizarre abdominal distension every evening that was gone every morning. I had a persistent pain, a dull, consistent, persistent pain in my right side and my lower back. Wouldn't go away, physical therapy, stretching, you name it, ice, heat, nothing. And then once or twice a week, I was nauseous after I ate something for no particular reason. I went to the doctor and nothing was identified. About three months later, 
I was at my annual GYN checkup, and my gynecologist felt something suspicious. She ordered an ultrasound, and it showed there was a growth on my right ovary. She explained that, you know, there were really good odds. It was a benign ovarian cyst. But there was a chance it was an ovarian cancer. So a CAT scan, blood work, and an appointment. About three weeks later, my husband and I are sitting in the doctor's office in the little room at the oncologist office. And my doctor was explaining that in the world of ovarian cysts and ovarian cancers, they actually do not do a biopsy because if it is cancerous, that procedure can then spread the cancer. He then went on to reassure me from all my tests and all my CAT scans and his knowledge over the years, he was very, very good odds it would not be cancer, that there was only a small chance that it would be cancer. So three weeks later, I was being prepped for surgery and I was praying and my mind was racing, please don't let it be cancer, please don't let it be cancer. Later that same day, in my hospital bed, I found out that it was cancer. I was a wreck. <laughs> I was inconsolable. All ration went out the window. All my determination, all my intention had not protected me from, an, from a cancer diagnosis. I was devastated both physically and emotionally. Since my diagnosis, I have learned that most people know very little about this specific type of cancer. Hands in the room, please, if you or someone you know has had prostate cancer. OK, thank you. Same for breast cancer. Thank you. If you or someone you know has had pancreatic cancer, and if you or someone you know has had ovarian cancer, oh, baby! <laughs> well, my, my next line is, uh, hands in the room reflect the overall odds, but actually they don't. That was way more for pancreatic and ovarian than the average statistics show. So as you can see, ovarian cancer is one of the less common cancers. And there is still a lot to learn about this type of cancer. They only found out a couple of years ago that it actually starts in the fallopian tubes. And at this time, there is no screening test. There is some great research going on all over, including the Stand Up to Cancer group just added last year a dream team for ovarian cancer. And as I mentioned, it has vague symptoms. So it often goes undiagnosed for months. It actually has very good survival rates when it's caught early, but as you can see, it's not usually caught early. I was fortunate. I was stage two. My doctor says he almost never sees it. I had my surgery, I did chemo, and my prognosis is excellent. I was also fortunate in many other ways. I have a wonderful husband who was at my side the entire time. I have family support. I have true friends who sat with me during chemo and then visited me the day after chemo, which for me was the hardest day. I also have great coworkers, and I had good health insurance. I mentioned my roommate earlier, Michelle, who passed away from ovarian cancer in 1990. She was originally diagnosed with stage one at the age of 28. Because she was young and the cancer was only on one ovary, they removed the cancerous ovary and they left the healthy ovary. And 12 years later, it returned to stage four and she passed away within the year. This is the daughter of a friend of mine. It is my sincere hope that when her generation turns 28, there will be a change in the world of ovarian cancer. And it is my intention 
to do what I can as a survivor to help that world change. So as an ovarian cancer survivor, because there are fewer women diagnosed with it, and then because a number of the women diagnosed with it do not survive, I meet very few other ovarian cancer survivors. If there are any in the room today at break, please find me. <laughs> um, um, I have met some at a support group, and I volunteered at the Teal Run here in Albany, and I met some women there, wonderful women at both places. But in my go about my own world everyday life, I have met four other ovarian cancer survivors. And certainly, no one expects a cancer diagnosis and no one deserves a cancer diagnosis. But some diagnoses are more shocking than others, and every one of these was shocking. People in the room are probably familiar with this. This is a list of things that can increase your risk of cancer from the American Cancer Society webpage. The four women I met had this world under control. And you'll notice that most of those are what I call actionable items, something you can actively do something about. This is the list of risk factors for ovarian cancer today from several different websites. And there are a couple of actionable items, but most of them are what I call not actionable items. All four of the women I met were fit women, under 63, non-smokers, ate close to the ground, exercised regularly, two were serious runners, none on prescription meds, and none had any previous cancers. These are the names of four other women who've had ovarian cancer. I have not met any of these people, and unfortunately, two of them have passed away, including Anna, who's pictured there. She was diagnosed with ovarian cancer at the age of 23. My emotional side was reeling. <laughs> this just can't be coincidence. There has to be a missing piece to this puzzle. So, my analytical side came back. It's alive again. <laughs> and I mulled all this over for a while. And then it came to me, there must be unidentified risk factors. What if, some, what if the world of fitness is actually a double-edged sword? What if the activities these people are engaging in that lower their risk for heart disease and dementia and stroke, what if something in that world actually increases your risk for ovarian cancer? Certainly. I know, I grew up with someone who did cancer research. Cancer is complicated and it has a randomness to it. But I think of the recent case of the soccer players. Several young, fit soccer players were diagnosed with different types of blood cancers. People thought at first it was kind of random. Then the University of Washington coach started gathering names. She now has over 200 names on that list, and over half the players were goalies. So now that data has been collected, and they're making connections, and they're starting to do research. What if the same is true for the world of ovarian cancer? What if the data is out there waiting to be collected, waiting to be analyzed, and what if that analysis can lead to risk factors that are actionable? What activities might compromise the fallopian tubes? Maybe tampon usage. Maybe tampons are a risk factor, and maybe active women wear more tampons. Or fitness clothes, which are made out of synthetic fibers and worn tight fitting. Or maybe yeast infections are a factor, and maybe Athletic women get more yeast infections. Who knows? But finding and identifying an actionable item that can empower a woman to decrease her risk for ovarian cancer, prevention is the holy grail. So, how to take 
my idea, based on anecdotal observations of four, <laughs> to the next level, how to gather more data. And at first, I was stumped. And then, the September 29th edition of the NPR TED Radio Hour was on citizen science. Citizen science is a broad term that encompasses many things, but it involves a person who is, uh, it involves citizens helping science move forward in a number of different ways. Two from the conservation world that you might have heard of are iNaturalist and eBird. So with that, I was inspired to bring my idea to you. <laughs> my idea is to do an online survey to move from four to 3,000. Analyze that data, share the results, and hopefully inspire some cancer foundations, some scientific researchers to do a full-blown study. Who knows what they might find? Science is amazing. So as I mentioned, goal is 3,000 women, 300 ovarian cancer survivors, 90-day window, share results in time for World, Oca World Ovarian Cancer Day on May 8th. So each of you is a data point. <laughs> And the goal is to use connections and spread and get more data points. Reach out to active women you know. Runners, rock climbers, swimmers, dancers, anyone you know who's in any kind of active world. So I am extremely honored to be here today to talk on this TEDx stage. Today also marks the first step in me honoring the promise to myself that I would use my cancer experience and the fact that I have survived that experience to make a difference in the world of ovarian cancer. So I have a call to action for everyone in the room. Women, complete the survey. Men, recruit one woman to complete the survey. Everyone talk with six women and encourage them to complete the survey. Spread the word. Share the hashtag. Share the URL for the website. Like the Facebook page. If everyone in this room actually does that, we'll reach a quarter of the goal of the survey. So I thank you in advance for your help with this extremely deadly cancer. <laughs>